All right, Mr. Sapor here, Marine Biology, and we are doing lecture notes number five. This week we're going to be doing a group called the bony fish. Uh, this is the largest group of uh, vertebrates in the world. Um, and so we started off with vertebrates looking at our agnathans, uh, our jawless fishes, and then we went to our chondrichthys, and then we jumped into seabirds because I got so excited. I wanted to talk about birds, and now we're back here into the bony fish, um, another uh, group. And so a little bit out of order, but that's okay. And if you look at a, um, a chart like this, a, a guide to um, you know fish of the Northwest or fishes of the Great Lakes, um, the majority of fish you see belong to this group called the bony fish. We'll talk about those in a minute, but those are your regular old fish. There's a few of the chondrichthys in here, a few sharks and bats. And here in the northwest chart, I don't even see any agnathans. I don't see a hagfish or a lamprey. If you go over to the Great Lakes, you'll see the sea lamprey. So there's an agnathan there. And then the rest of these look like they are all belonging to a group called the bony fish. So let's talk about this group. So again, classification. We're talking about the animal kingdom, and then we're talking about the vertebrate phylum, and then within that vertebrate phylum, there are a number of different classes. And so we had Agnatha as a class, we had Chondrichthys as a class, the cartilaginous fish, and now we have Osteichthys, um, meaning the bony fish, right? So osteo referring to bones, con referring to cartilage and the chondrichthys. So these are your bony fishes. Um, there are three, uh, basically, classes of fish, um, and this is the largest one out there. So it's the largest class of vertebrate in existence today. So um, bony fish outnumber every other type of, of vertebrate, including mammals, uh, reptiles, birds, and amphibians, and then uh, the other two types of fishes as well. Um, the evolution and characteristics of these. So there are two different subclasses um, within this group. So we can break this group of bony fish into two different subclasses. And those consist of the lobe fin fishes, or sarcoterygy. <laughs> Honestly, I never pronounce that word. So um, the lobe fin fishes there. And um, and then we can break them up into uh, the bony fishes, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, if we look at a chart here, and we'll uh, we'll jump into a few of these notes first. So the the lobe fin fishes or the sarcoterygy first appeared 420 million years ago. Uh, they these are actual very uh, very much living fossils. Um, today they are a very small group, uh, and by very small I mean very small. Uh, there are a total of six lobe fin fishes in the world today. Not very many. Four of them occur in freshwater, and two of them are marine um, fishes. And the two marine ones are the West Indian coelacanth and then the Indonesian coelacanth. Coelacanth is a weird looking fish, and again, really very much a living uh, fossil. If you look at a chart, kind of going through some of these different groups through time, right? So now we're looking back in time here. We're looking uh, when first, when fish and vertebrates really kind of first arose, right? Right around uh, 500 million years ago or so. We have the jawless fishes, the agnathans and um, the hagfish uh, and lampreys right here, this group, and they still exist today. So by this little narrow point that it shows right here, we're showing that there's a very small group that exists today. There, there were more, there was more diversity in the past, but that diversity narrowed in around the tri, uh, Triassic Jurassic boundary. So this is during the age of the dinosaurs. And this boundary right here, I want to say is about 145 million years ago. 200, I'm off. Oh, Jurassic Cretaceous is 145. Okay, it's been a while since I took geology. Um, there are other groups that are totally extinct. So the placoderms is a group of fish that is totally extinct. And these went extinct, um, you know, before even the Mesozoic in a time called the Paleozoic, which is all these um, geologic eras in here. This collectively throughout here is the age of fishes. This is when we see fish diversity really take off and vertebrate diversity really take off. Chondrichthys is anchored down in here at around 420 million years ago or so. The uh, 400 maybe, and according to this, the chondrichthys takes off. They have a narrowing during this time as well, during this Permo-Triassic. This was a huge extinction right here, the Permo-Triassic extinction. Um, 90... 
five or more percent of all living things on Earth went extinct during this extinction. Bigger than the uh, dinosaur extinction, which would have been right in here. Uh, they often call this either the, uh, the Permo-Triassic or the KT um, uh, extinction there. Okay, so con uh, chondrichthys here. Ray fin fishes, which we'll talk about next, take off uh, back down in here and really diversify. And lobe fin fishes, uh, the Sarcopterygii <laughs> group, um, starts right in here as well. Uh, has a little bit of a widening and then narrows and is a very narrow group today, along with the jawless fishes as well. Bigger group being the ray fin and then the cartilaginous. Amphibians and reptiles branch off of this and they branch off from the lobe fin fishes. Lobe fin fishes have features that um, we see as being ancestral to tetrapods, things with four limbs. Um, one of them is these, these um, limbs right here that really operate with bones in them, much like arms do. They're not completely attached um, to a shoulder blade yet, but there are um, fish that we have found in um, the uh, fossil record. Tectolic uh, is a type of fish that was found from right around in this time right in here where um, we see has features of these uh, fish and then also has features in amphibians as well. Kind of cool. Okay. And then ray fin fishes is the next group. I want to back up for just a second though, because I want to bring up anything that's in blue is hyperlinked. And so here you can see the lobe fin fishes and show some pictures real quick because I think they're pretty cool to talk about them. So these are some of the fossil records. This is one of the early ones here, known from uh, the Silurian time, about 419 million years ago. And it has a combination of features. Um, and then the ones that exist today, the West Indian coelacanth. And then there's some lungfish, uh, commonly referred to as salamander fish. Uh, here's the Tiktaalik fossil that I was talking about as that bridge, uh, 375 million years. Okay, for that one there. Uh, between the fish and the amphibians. And here's a coelacanth. And these were thought extinct, actually, uh, pretty prolific in the fossil record. And then um, one was found in a market um, in the Mediterranean um, by a paleontologist. The dude was just out there selling one. When you look back at time, though, um, you can see that there are lots of different species and groups. Now, when they have a little cross next to their name here, this means that it is no longer existing today. It's an extinct lineage. These existed in the fossil record. The, the, the dates here are simply when they were first named, and this is the name of the person who discovered and named them. But all of these, if you go back, look at all the crosses here. So this was a bigger group historically, and there's only six today, but there were many more in the past that existed. Okay, let's jump in and let's talk about the fish we have today that are the most common, the ray fin fishes. Um, Actinoterygii is the group of ray fin fishes, and this is the most dominant group of vertebrates in the world. Uh, there's 30,000 extant species, and by extant, that means existing today in the world, or 99% of all fish species in the world belong to this group. So um, it's a huge and very diverse group of fish, the most diverse group of vertebrates in the world. And out of that 30,000, there's about 13,000 um, of those are marine. So a little under half are marine. Um, I find that number kind of surprising. I would expect more to be marine, but um, I would imagine that with all of the diversity of freshwater environments, you're going to have, um, you know, divergent evolution is going to lead to a whole ton of different species in all kinds of different freshwater environments as well. So I would see probably expect, I guess, there would be a high diversity in that group as well. We're going to focus on the ray fin fishes. And again, um, just click on any one of these. I have them all hyperlinked. And it'll take you to uh, either a photo page or, um, you know, a Wikipedia that has tons of information on it as well. Cool beans. Let's go to the next slide. All right, and just again then to emphasize with, with those numbers, most of the fish in the world belong to this group of ray fin fishes. Um, in either one of these, you're not even going to see a lobe fin fish. There's only six and only two are marine and one's in the Indian Ocean 
right? Um, and then the other one um, is up uh, in the Atlantic, I believe, off the coast of the Mediterranean. Okay, Osteichthys, bony fish, ray fin fishes, Actinoterygii, pterygii, how do I say it? Distinguishing characteristics. So what makes this group, um, what makes them stand out compared to cartilaginous fish, compared to agnathans, and um, compared to the lobe fin fish, the ray fin fish have um, some features that they all share in common, which make them really successful. One, they have a skeleton made of bone. And, and bone can be lighter and smaller than cartilage. Um, if you've ever cartilage, if you've ever pulled a bone um, out of a fish you've been eating, you can see how small and pointy and light and flexible they are. This led to the evolution of smaller body sizes. Most um, out of that group of 30,000 are not big fish, right? Most are tiny fish. Think about a tropical aquarium, how small some of those fish can be. And so that skeleton made of bone allowed them to reduce weight and then to reduce size. And so reduced size is helpful in an ocean environment when there's lots of nooks and crannies you can hide in. And there's lots of small food available, right? If you're eating lower in the energy pyramid, lower down in the food chain, there's actually more food available to you as well. And flexible skin scales. So the scales that cover their body are fish scales. Uh, if you ever peel them off, they're really flexible. They're really thin and light. They provide good armor. And um, they also provide a diversity of color variation, which is helpful. Um, and okay, good. I've been talking about membrane spin in a minute. Um, so this provides again color variation, camouflage. Um, in some cases, it's it's helpful to be colorful to attract mates and things like that. Uh, but there's a lot of variety in that uh, swim bladder. So one of the things that bony fish have is a gas-filled bladder that runs right through and it's kind of almost attached to their spine right at the base of it. If you've ever skinned a fish and taken out um, the, the, the stomach and intestinal content, you'll notice this little thin air sac that sits right up at the back, the, at the top base where the spine kind of starts um, within the gut sac. And this um, air sac allows them to float. Cartilaginous fish don't have that. Uh, because chondrichthys doesn't have an air bladder, um, they have that big oily liver, double lobed liver that's filled with oil uh, that gives them some buoyancy, but not nearly as buoyant as a bony fish can be. So they don't have to move as much um, to stay afloat. They can be smaller in size and they can basically be neutrally buoyant so they don't have to use any energy or calories to just stay where they are in the water column and not you know go up or start to sink one of the other features is this membranous fin supported by rays um, this feature is super important to their um, survival and adaptation <clears throat> especially small ones that live in rocky environments or most of these do. They're associated with some type of cover or place to hide. And it allows them to maneuver really agilely. It allows them to move forward and then backward really quickly. If you've ever seen fish in a tropical reef, even looking at my tropical aquarium in the classroom, fish will often be out. And if you approach or move fast, they just shoot backwards really rapidly and disappear into a crack and can hide. Those fins can allow them to kind of move in a forward or backward direction really quickly and instantly. Um, and so that allows for this fine movement, both for getting away from predators, but also then in hunting and things like that. Okay. Um, and allows them to maneuver through really tight kind of nooks and crannies. Okay. Part of uh, what I'm going to have you do for this um, unit on your weekly questions, you'll see that one of the parts is the anatomy of a fish. So I want you to know the, the main parts. Um, I think there's about 10 of them here on this chart to the bony fish anatomy um, and those are covered here so it's in this drawing here it's also a hyperlink right here where it covers them i think in a bit more detail this takes us to this wikipedia and it has them labeled down in here and it has the internal anatomy as well labeled on that some of these you don't need to know like the brain i don't have that labeled on there um, for the gills, I actually have the operculum. So between this and 
this drawing here. Actually, we'll switch to the next slide because I believe I blew it up there. Let's go. Here, perfect. So with your rainfin fish, there's some uh, basic blueprinting that applies to all of them, even weird ones like your pipefish or eels. Uh, not true eels like a lamprey, but um, a modified fish like a wolf eel is actually just a modified bony fish. It's not a real eel. So on the back, they have dorsal fins. These can come in ones, twos, threes, fours. There is a lot of variety there, but they're commonly referred to as dorsal fins. And then um, the tail is referred to as the caudal fin. And this little restriction right in here between the body and the actual caudal fin is called the caudal peduncle. Peduncle. It's kind of a funky word. Um, but that can, uh, how, how wide that is, how long that is, uh, how prominent that is, um, can be a distinguishing feature when you're uh, trying to identify fish in various field guides. Uh, the fin uh, located right near their pooper, it's called the anal fin. And then uh, right underneath, you know, the fin where they would do push-ups. Think of your pelvic uh, muscles, your pectorals. That's your pelvic uh, fin in there. Oh, I'm sorry, the pelvic fin's down. Pectoral muscles are up top next to the gills. Okay, so the pelvic fin's near the stomach. And then the pectoral muscles are right up here. Again, the ones you lean down and do push-ups on there. Um, they usually have a pair of pectoral fins, so one on each side. And then... Covering the gills, and one of the distinguishing features, too, of this group is that if you remember on chondrichthys and sharks, they have visible gill slits. And depending on the group of sharks they belong to, there's any number of those. Um, usually I think they have about five to seven visible gill slits. On the agnathans, it's holes, and there's about seven holes on those that you can see. An adaptation these guys have is they have a bony plate that covers over their gills. It's, that bony plate is called an operculum. And that operculum can open when they're breathing, so taking blowing water out through the gills. But then it closes to protect the gills um, from things like parasites because the gills have a lot of blood running through them, just like your lungs would. They're a highly intravated organ system, and there's gas exchange going on there all the time. It's how they respire. And it's even how they do get rid of some waste as well. There's some nitrogen ammonia byproducts that leak out of the gills from their blood as well. Um, parasites are attracted to the gills, right? It's, it's, it's a soft part that has a lot of blood, so parasites are attracted. And if you're trying to hurt a fish, well, going for the gills would be a place to do that. So that operculum, that bony plate, protects and covers them, and they can seal that shut. Um, oftentimes, the operculum has little spines on it as well, in the case of rockfish. Uh, one of our more common species um, around here, there's about 30 different species in this one genus, Sebastes. They all have little spines off the operculum, and if you grab them wrong, it'll stick your hand um, and hurt pretty bad. Okay, so the operculum uh, and mouth eyes, duh. <laughs> Bony fish have uh, nasal passages, small little nose holes there. And then, um, and then the dorsal, the anal pelvic pectoral fins and then the tails the caudal and this little restriction is called the caudal peduncle okay <clears throat> if you remember before um, when we talked about plankton we divided the the, the ocean up um o ocean life uh into two kind of groups um and really we're gonna break it up into three First, there is the nectin, and then there's the plankton. And plankton, by definition, is something that drifts, versus nectin is it's something that can swim against the current. Um, so it's not carried away by the ocean currents. Um, can resist that and can stay you know, wherever it is, um, even if the ocean currents are sweeping it in a different direction. So nectin is composed mainly of this group of bony fish, osteichthys and chondrichthys. That makes up the majority of the larger, um, you know, nectonic species in the ocean. Uh, to a lesser amount, uh, marine mammals, seals, sea lions, um, whales, dolphins, and then, um, not here, but manatees as well, um, make up that group. Marine reptiles, 
Again, we don't have any marine reptiles here on the Oregon coast, but in some places in the world, there are, actually that's not true. I guess we have a few turtles you can see offshore, but they don't really breed here on the coast. But uh, sea turtles, uh, sea snakes, and uh, crocodilians uh, make up another group. Um, the only marine lizard in the world is the Galapagos iguana, by the way. And then, of course, seabirds uh, make up another group of what we would consider nectin ocean organisms. And we're going to talk a little bit about nectin here and kind of close the loop on, um, on, on this. Um, so that we can divide nectin into two kind of categories, much like we can divide plankton into two categories. If you remember, we divided plankton into holoplankton or meroplankton. You spend your holo life as plankton or you spend just part of your life as plankton, generally in a larval stage. The same goes with nectin. So what we refer to um, when we're talking about nectin, there are uh, organisms that we refer to as holoepipelagic. I know, that's a big, uh, that's a big mouthful there. They spend their whole life in the epipelagic zone. Looking at ocean zones, and, um, we didn't cover this yet. We kind of skipped past it. Um, and we may circle back on it. In the ocean, the, the uh, different zonation names, the epipelagic zone is the upper 200 meters of the ocean. It also corresponds to what's called the photic zone. So the photic zone is where photosynthesis happens. It's where light penetrates. And at a maximum depth, light uh, can penetrate down to 200 meters, 600 feet. That's in clear water. Um, if the water is turbid or is you know, cloudy due to phytoplankton, um, that can shrink, you know, to 50 meters, um, just 150 feet. It can get really dark after that. So that epipelagic zone, again, I'd say probably 50 to 200 meters deep. Um, and then there's different zones below that. There's the meso and then the bathy. By pelagic, we mean open ocean, out in the ocean, not really associated with land, right? Um, in other words, these are organisms that aren't um, attached to the bottom of the ocean or the shoreline. So in the holo uh, epipelagic um, form of nectin, these are organisms that then spend their whole life out in the open ocean. They are not coming near land. They are not going to the bottom or hiding in rocks or anything like that. These are just open ocean organisms. Um, at the top of the food chain, you'll find sharks. Um, tuna, this is a great video that I will put up linked of uh, tuna fishing. You can see how fast they are. Here off our coastline, our main uh, form of tuna is albacore tuna, uh, marlin, swordfish, some of these bigger, um, really fast hunting fish. You have to be fast out in the open ocean because you're hunting smaller fish that are also really fast. And then, um, yeah, because there's nowhere to hide, so you got to be fast. Meroepipelagic means they spend only part of their life cycle in this open ocean zone, um, and then the rest of the time uh, they're doing something else, probably being benthic or associated with kelp beds or rocks. So some spend their life in the epipelagic out in the open ocean, but then they may come near shore to spawn, or they may even, you know, go um, inland to spawn in the case of salmon. So examples of this uh, would be herring, um, tiny little bait fish, and I have a video on them here. They're out in the open ocean uh, where they get, you know, preyed on by tuna, marlin, and swordfish. Sharks are then feeding on those fish. Uh, but then part of the year they come in close to shore and, um, and spawn uh, right in like the kelp beds and then the rocks and intertidal zone and littoral neuritic zones. And some are epipelagic during certain times of day. So they may move up out into the open water at night to feed, uh, maybe feeding on some of those um, zooplankton due to vertical migration. But then during um, the, the daytime, they may go down and hide underneath rocks and things like that. So that's what makes them, you know, uh, yeah. Marrow, not holo. Most meroplankton. Um, juvenile stage is epipelagic zone and then benthic. That's true of meroplankton. Um, and then I have some videos here that I have linked as well. Some cool ones kind of showing uh, what's going on down on the bottom of the ocean. 
Some of these are taken at our marine reserves right here off the Oregon coast. So I encourage you to click that link and then go there and check out. I got a whole series of them that I've posted by uh, Oregon Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife. Um, some really cool ones there from the marine reserves. Okay. Um, boom, but a boom, but a boom. That's it. Pretty easy week. So. Closing the loop, um, talking about osteichthyes and bony fish, of course, the biggest group of those um, being the ray fin fish, smallest group of those by far being the low fin fish, of which there's only six in the world today and two of them in the ocean, living fossils. Um, and all of those, you know, the, the again, the agnath and sechondrichthys and the bony fish uh, comprise this big group of ocean organisms called nectin, and we can contrast that to plankton. Right. These are the things we can see with our eyes that are out there swimming around. Um, also included in nectin, we got marine mammals, reptiles, and birds, and we can divide nectin up into, um, you know, do they spend their whole life out in the open ocean, uh, or do they spend just part of their life, maybe a juvenile stage, or do they um, move out into this open ocean zone, um, you know, just during part of the day, or seasonally, or migratorily. We'll jump into um, this this nearer zone right over in here, this intertidal and this benthic bottom zone, right? You're not plankton uh, or nectin if you are tied to the bottom. You're neither because you're at the bottom of the ocean. You're what we would call benthic. And we'll jump into that more probably next week. All right. Have a good one. Um, the weekly questions will be posted along with this video. So go ahead and fill those out. And I will also be posting up some videos um, that I have linked in here as well. But feel free just to go to the lecture itself, click through those slides. Uh, I believe they're slides number 44 through 49 this week, and follow the hyperlinks and have a look for yourself. All right.